Our guest today is the freshly Emmy-nominated co-host of NFL Live, uh, ESPN NFL analyst Mina Kimes, also, of course, host of the Mina Kimes Show featuring Lenny. Uh, Mina, thanks so much for doing this. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you for having me. Fun, fun and interesting time to talk about the Washington football team. Yes. Uh, although it, interesting for a different way than we're used to, which honestly, thank God. <laughs> Uh, it, has, it has been a wild couple of years, but um, what we wanted to have you on because we're big fans of what you're doing with the war room concept on your your show. And I think it's really fun to kind of just like put that pressure on in the moment. So we, f- we thought we'd start with a couple of the teams there, but obviously spend a little bit more time, undue time, if you will, uh, on Washington, or I guess it would be undue time if this wasn't ultimately supposed to be a commander's podcast. Um, so with one, obviously it's Caleb Williams. We know that and, and thus yeah. we can skip it. But when you, for you, you've put Drake May up there for folks. You put Jaden Daniels up there for folks. I don't know if you put a JJ McCarthy up for, for anybody to select from. I have um, not. <laughs> I have not. But, done yeah. but you did put a, a pretty interesting trade up for Chris Sims this week on the most recent version with that Minnesota, uh, you know, 11, 23, and basically every second round pick that they are allowed to offer. So we let's take the trade off the table for a second and just the, the two that you have at the top. If I put you on the clock and say Jaden Daniels, Drake May, who's your pick for Washington at two? Yeah, my pick is Drake May, which uh, going into this whole draft season, I thought was going to be the consensus. Turned out it's far from the consensus. In fact, you've got Jane Daniels now um, being picked to go first overall by some analysts. Not, not going to happen, but uh, some of my colleagues uh, like him better than Caleb Williams. Um, but for me, it's May um, for a number of reasons. Uh, I, I think the biggest one is I just think the traits at this point, when you look around the NFL and you see the quarterbacks – like Mahomes, Josh Allen, Justin Herbert, uh, just that common thread of the unbelievable arm talent with the second reaction ability is something that I see in May, which isn't to say he, he's going to be any of them, but um, I think he's very unique in that way. Um, I also think at North Carolina, he faced a ton of adversity this season, really difficult situation, uh, lapses in pass protection, uh, vastly inferior weapons, of course, to Daniels. And I think that explains a lot of the uh, issues at time you saw on tape. So I like his upside a lot. Um, you know, uh, might take him a second to sort of reach the ceiling, but I think because of how high the ceiling is, I would pick him second overall. Is there any reservation about some of the like technical stuff you see on tape? Obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, with like um, footwork, the drops, kind of the inaccuracies. Like, and you, you mentioned, like, I think I, w- I would be in total agreement with you, right? It's a- extremely imp- important to like acknowledge his ceiling is probably the highest of anybody in the class outside of Caleb Williams, but like, is he going to get there? Right. You know, Allen, they kind of sat with him for three years. You know, Mahomes got to sit all these guys with all these kind of tools that need developmental periods made it happen. Is Washington in a position where they can make that happen? And do you think he can get there? It's a great question about Washington being in the position to start with. And you mentioning that some of those like toolsier raw quarterbacks having time or, you know, in, the case of like Allen, like a really good situation in Buffalo where it actually took Josh Allen two years to really become Josh Allen, uh, you know, they go out, they build, they trade for Stephon Diggs, for example. Um, and I think with Washington, it's a good question because while Washington has the skill players, the offensive line is a huge, huge question mark, even with some of the additions that they made in free agency. Um, that said, I don't think um, – like I don't see May as a prospect where issues in pass protection I think would um, affect him necessarily. Uh, like you know the, the whole David Carr example. Um, to me, it would more be about coaching and scheme. And actually, that's probably the bigger question I have is Cliff Kingsbury also more than the uh, personnel around him. Is he the right play caller to develop him? I do like the fact that there's Cliff Kingsbury the the play caller, and then there's Cliff Kingsbury the developer of quarterbacks. And I think actually it's that second part that I'm maybe more confident in, and I have. I, I like the fit more from that perspective because to your point, there is some mechanical stuff that needs to be cleaned up. Yeah. Um, it, it's every time you feel like you make a decision, we're just like, all right, the guy that we like is this. And the minute that name comes out of your mouth, you're like, ah, but you're passing up over here. And I, I think it's also like a patience thing. Um, yeah. You know, Washington fans have been waiting for so long. And so for some of them, they look at the Marcus Mariota side and they're like, that dude can't play. You have to take Jaden Daniels. <laughs> like what's your kind of your, your, as you've looked at this longitudinally over the years, the tolerance for teams to 
wait Actually and have sin. the patience yeah, yeah versus no. he's the playing out we're kind of play. the yeah. play. let's be real and, but, and but like, I, I think the allen example yeah. is good though because like he both sat and played at the same time like they insulated yeah. him in a way that worked and he played pretty quickly i mean everybody plays the only guys you don't play are like jordan love because you have aaron Rodgers, patrick mahomes people forget how freaking good alex smith was that finally like alex smith was, this is like one of my big pet peeves is the retconning of like alex smith's career alex smith's <laughs> final year in kansas city was extremely good like that offense was excellent and he was yeah. also pushing the ball downfield um so usually you know when you look at these guys who have sat and it, the, the willingness of teams to sit him it's not really about the rawness of the quarterback although i certainly think that helped jordan love you know getting a chance to sort of especially because of the college situation he was coming from but rather it's about the quarterback who's playing ahead of them and a team like washington i think marcus Mariota is a perfectly serviceable backup quarterback whoever you draft will play he will play it is not it, new england i think is actually uh, a situation where you actually might see a quarterback sitting because i think Brissett, you guys saw in, in limited uh exposure is like probably one of the best quarterback backup quarterbacks in the entire nfl in my opinion yep. so uh but i think with washington whoever you draft you're going to get out on the field quickly um honestly for better or worse yeah, and I think that's a really interesting observation because I do think that uh, there are ways to insulate a quarterback. I think Joe Flacco, Ben Roethlisberger, Russell Wilson, kind of this defense first rushing attack approach, which I think could be implemented here. And I think it goes back to your point about Cliff kind of, you know, the developer of quarterbacks and how they insulate them. Is there, I, my, my one question coming out of this conversation, because I think I agree with everything you said, is why no, not why not JJ? Why is he not in this conversation for you? Yeah, I, I, I do like JJ. And the more I watched him, the more I got it. Right. Especially when you look at him through the lens of some of the, I would say, the predominant scheme in today's NFL, the Shanahan offenses. You look at him, it's so easy to imagine him slotting into one of those offenses. It's easy to see why those coaches would privilege his skill set. He's accurate. He throws over the middle of the field, which not all the quarterback prospects do in this draft. Um, he is athletic. Uh, and so I get it. It makes sense. However, there are questions for me. Um, I think his arm talent is not up to it, it, Let's just compare him to May, for example, um, who seems to be kind of the faller and JJ's the riser. Who knows how much of that is real? Uh, obviously, uh, Drake May is bigger. And I think, you know, the tools are there. The arm talent to me is more impressive. You don't see that same sort of out of structure playmaking with JJ uh, consistently that you see with Drake May. You see a little bit. He throws on the run really well. Again, I like him as like a boot quarterback, but um so there's that. And then, you know, uh, as far as like the throws go, he is accurate. Um, there aren't that, to me, that many touch throws on tape. It's a lot of line drives. Um, so I think I have questions too about sort of ability there compared to, again, the top three quarterbacks. So I think you see that all with them on their tape. Um, and, and then, yeah, some of it is just sample size straight up. Like, you know, the, the guy wasn't asked to do a lot. A lot of that was because of the offense. And I think there's a bit of projection going on that I get, I get why that's alluring, right? Um, which is always like the unknown, but for me, it raises questions. Yeah. It's funny. Cause I think Logan and I both had the same thing, but we also have had to check our biases big time with JJ because it looks like, as you said, the predominant system, which he played in and I've covered the, my entirety of my career. Um, and, and he played in for almost the entirety of his career. Um, so it's like, oh yeah, that looks like NFL. That's the, the NFL we know. And so it's, well, it's the hard. offense is an NFL offense. Yeah. You're watching right. a guy run it. I mean, so much like I was just, we were on NFL Live talking about Bo Nix, and I was like, dude, I don't know. I mean, I, like, <laughs> I, I, yeah, it's like RPOs and screens right. and, and guys wide open off of like, yeah, it's so college y. Whereas when you watch JJ McCarthy, it looks like he's under yeah. center, he's booting, like it, you, you see it. So I think it's, it's just a lot easier. And then I think with the success of like Brock Purdy, and he's kind of like, okay, maybe it could be Purdy plus, you know? Um, right. You see why coaches like it. It's the same reason why Kirk Cousins just got four years, $180 million, you know? It's like, right. 100%. I get it. So if we go back to the war room scenario and I say, yeah. okay, May's your guy, but I'm going to offer you the same Minnesota deal that you offered Chris Sims on your show. Would you still just take May or would you have interest with where Washington is uh, in that Minnesota trade back? I'm taking May. I think Washington has enough talent to where it's not like, oh my God, this team is a disaster and there's so many holes. I mean, there's some pretty market holes at pretty premium positions, no doubt, on this roster. But I think because you already have really good wide receivers, um, you have really good interior defensive line, there, there's still, you have enough talent to where I don't feel like it's a total teardown and where the, the quarterback is being put in an awful, like an untenable position to succeed. I also think at a certain point, it's like, 
you got it. You need a quarterback, right? And if you're a team that's kind of been waiting through it for a while, I think you just kind of hit a wall with it where you're like, all right, we got to take a quarterback. We got to, and you have a chance to get a really good one. Yeah, awesome. And so then I guess, um, yeah, I don't know. What's the next pick we got, Craig? We got like a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, of we could, there, we could, you know? want to talk about untenable. We can go to New England. We can just go to three and uh, the, the situation there. But I yeah. think that, like, you know, the, we talk about these inflection points in the draft and where this thing flips. And I, I think really the next, I mean, three, obviously, whether New England sits or trades back, that's an inflection point because that shapes depending, you know, where the yeah. quarterbacks go, how desperate teams get. Arizona, same thing. LA, same thing. New York, like, is a quarterback there for them? Do they get aggressive and go up? Like, I, I really feel like every pick, I mean, even seven at Tennessee is a really, like, low-key interesting one to me. Like, I, I feel like the draft could just veer off in a bunch of different directions at any one of those picks. I think you could see teams trading up to, like you said, every spot from three through nine, which is wild. But not just because of the quarterback factor. So at three, four, five whatever team wants either QB3 or JJ McCarthy, maybe even higher, whatever, you're suddenly looking at, okay, any of those teams, Minnesota, Las Vegas, Denver, could potentially trade up. But I'll say this too, like the wide receivers, the top three wide receivers in this draft, uh, Harrison Jr., Odunze, and Neighbors, are so good and so universally thought of that way that I wouldn't be surprised if you might see a surprise trade up to seven, eight, nine from one of those receivers too, which is crazy because that so rarely happens. So let me yeah. let me flip this oh, question yeah. to both of you then. Like if you're one of those teams, any team between three and nine, so that is New England, Arizona, LA, the Giants, Tennessee, Atlanta, Chicago, uh, for those that don't have a draft board in front of them at home, which of those teams most wants to trade back? Like who who benefits the most from getting out of that range? Whether because the player that they like is is probably best taken later. They need to get multiple picks. Uh, Mina, start with you. Like who who wants to get yeah. out of there the most? So originally, I thought the Cardinals are the obvious one because that roster has more needs than positions of stability. Frankly, like you look at that roster, you're feeling good about offensive tackle, tight end, McBride, safety. That's it. A quarterback, right? So, but they do have an extra first from the uh, Texans trade last year and then an extra third round pick. So they have a ton of draft capital. And increasingly, I'm like, ah, at a certain point, you can't, I know their they're, they're GM likes to trade money off support, but like at a certain point, you just take Marvin Harrison Jr., man. Like, that's what I would do, honestly. I get the, it, it, it makes sense. Um, but I just think, you know, you got enough picks and you got to start building a roster with really like your core players. Uh, the Chargers, to me, are the team that I, I, I would trade down if I were them, frankly, because that's a, I think it, it has been a highly overrated roster now for several years, um, and suddenly you're looking at it, and you're just so many positions of need. Um, so while taking one of those wide receivers would be really tempting or offensive tackle, they've been linked with Joe Alt a lot, I would really consider taking a haul if it's available to them. Yeah, I totally agree. I think stylistically, like who Harbaugh wants to be, I don't think there's a player there in that in that kind of range that you feel really good about. I think Joe Alt's a guy that gets a lot of love, but I think he's a little bit more developmental than people want to think. I think Olo Fashano is kind of a lot of people's too. I don't think he's physical enough, quite frankly, for what Harbaugh wants to be. That's so great. I think you're kind of in that J.C. Latham, Troy Fontenew, Marius Mims kind of range, and I could easily train down to 11 and probably yeah. get one of those guys there. Yeah. Uh, Talisi Fuaga is the other guy. So I just think stylistically, uh, the culture they're trying to build there, you're looking for a big, mauling right tackle that can block gap scheme runs and be aggressive. So why why not get some money in return for the player that you really want, which is later in the draft? Yeah. Totally agree. Uh, so that brings us then to 7 and 8, Tennessee and Atlanta which have been like, at this point feels like a joke. It's like, okay, it's Tennessee, pencil yeah. and all Atlanta, pencil and Turner, which do you think is less likely to actually happen that way? It's such a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I did it. I asked the good question, Logan. I'm so sorry. We've been doing this podcast for two years. I, I haven't know, asked you a single good. one. The meet has been and here that, for 10 minutes. And I've, here we are. I've done this war room draft now four times and every single time it's gone all yep. turn or, you know, yep. I, and it's just, I think it'll be really hard though for uh, at both those teams to turn down the t the big three receivers. But it's so obviously not what they should do. So I think that the more the more likely outcome to to give to I guess throw a little bit of a curveball would be Tennessee trading down and someone else jumping 
uh, the Jets and the Bears to get like Odunze because Tennessee thinks, to Logan's point, we can get one of those offensive tackles a little bit later. That would be the more likely outcome. Yeah, and I was going to say, like, Tennessee, to me, like, knowing Bill Callahan and knowing stylistically, like, who he wants to be, they want to run a lot of duo, want to get the ball downhill. Like, again, both those players don't really fit, like, from a cultural standpoint. The, I mean, the one that gets me, and I think you've talked about this on your show, Mina, is the Atlanta one with Dallas Turner. Like, when I watched the tape I of Dallas Turner, I'm like – the guy to me is Latu Latu, like is a pass rusher. And I know there's the medical stuff. I know there's the stuff. But like if I want 10 sacks next year, the guy I'm drafting is the kid from UCLA. Like I'm not going in on this like uh, trade C. Again, the traits are important, no doubt. Oh, no, but you're I right. Get you, I want to get your thoughts on it. You're, this is a head heart thing for me because my heart, it, like I like Latu's tape better. I mean, he's yeah. so freaking polished as a pass rusher. And it's so – and I and – I, it's so easy for me to imagine him being productive in the NFL immediately, but I try to put on my GM hat when I think about it. And it's like, the, obviously the injuries are real and, and it's something you have to consider. But then like, you know, with these pass rushers, you do the traits and the length and the athleticism and all of that and the size and, and all of it does. I mean, Latu's athletic though. It's not like he's, he, he's not, not athletic, but um, yeah, I, I have, I have questioned the fact that I have Turner in chalk there. He does have a lot I like, you know, I think no doubt. more explosive, for example. But you do wonder, you're like, okay, well, like, where's the production? You know, is this the production of a top 10 pick? <laughs> and we have seen in recent years, by the way, like the traits here, edge rushers have struggled in the NFL. Yeah. You think about Walker in Jacksonville. Um, so I, I, I have been wrestling with this as well. And this is something it's almost like Atlanta. It's, it's like not, it's kind of a curse for them to pick at eight and maybe they're a trade down because <laughs> no, because it does feel too high, right. To take yeah. the it's three years in a row that they've, they've been at eight. So like literally they are cursed. That's, that's, and it's, and this is the year, by the way, more than any of those other years where actually you do want to take a skill player at eight and they don't need a skill player because of the way they've drafted. Right. So it's like kind of weirdly, the board is not perfect for them because yeah so maybe they're more of a trade down team actually as we talk this through the other thing i wanted to ask you is obviously we talked edge rusher there is is the best defensive player an edge rusher or is it a corner or is it a interior defensive player because I, I think like i look at you know quinion mitchell and I, he's my highest rated corner yeah. and from a trade standpoint from a reduction standpoint maybe it fits that bill a little bit more acutely or there's Byron Murphy, who, again, like there's issues there in terms of total production. He's on the ground a little bit more than you'd like. But in terms of upside, he's like Grady Jarrett's clone. And they have yeah. a lot of success with undersized interior players. So I think Murphy's the best defensive player, to answer your question. Um, Look at this. Look at this. Look at yeah. that. That's kind of where I landed. Yeah, I, I, I um, just like all around, like when you think, I don't know. I, I think he probably has the highest floor and the highest ceiling to me. Mm. Um, but just because of positional value, I have it going a little bit later. Hmm. We'll see, though. Well, I don't know. But wait, say that again. Well, like, we just saw all these defensive tackles get paid 20 million yeah, bucks. Sorry. When I say, I meant not positional value, um, needs rather more. Needs, so, like, I got you. At the I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're about no, to fight on the show. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's a good time to be a defensive tackle. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, uh, him and Newton, who's the other three tech that keeps getting kind of pushed up boards, like, I think, um, you have to take that in consideration if you're a team picking in the in the middle, like your Seahawks at 16. The Seahawks at 16 is the kind of the team, but the Rams at 19 are the other obvious thing. Like it's now, I mean, positional. This is where like positional value does help. Like, yeah, there's actually a huge benefit to getting a penetrating three tech on a rookie deal for four years. Um, and it's why, like you know, like I like Bowers could be the faller where a guy like that might rise. Well, so that's actually where I wanted to go next. If we want to get into a fight, we can talk about tight ends, Logan. Well, yeah, you know let's, nothing let's, about that let's position. Let's talk about so, that. You yeah. know, only played it for 10 years. Uh, not like Brock Bowers did, that's for sure. No, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs>